with hope, to be an optimist. And it's always the optimists who turned out to be great leaders in history. I humbly believe that we're in the presence of three great leaders today. And they are optimists. I know, because I've met them. I'm going to introduce them just with their first names, because that's how I operate. The first gentleman that's going to come up today, his name is Peter. If you want to read his bio, you can do that. But I would like to give him all the time to talk about what's in his heart. I asked him a very simple question. Pretend I'm a child and tell me what you do for a living. And he said, I let nature rule. With that, Peter, the platform is yours. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you on a journey of a place that truly wows me and uh, creates wonder for not just me, but for many. Before I take you through the Grand Canyon, which I've spent a lot of time, I'm going to back up just a little bit and explain how I got there. I've worked for National Geographic for roughly 20 years and many others, where I was sent on assignment all over the world to do stories of the Sherpa on the south side of Everest or to do unusual adventure stories involving replicating antique aviation stories through Africa. And after doing this for some two decades and doing some foolish moves, this perhaps being one of the most foolish, where I decided I needed a shower after a long journey through Antarctica by kayak, uh, you could say that my wanderlust of travel perhaps experienced a little bit of shrinkage. Uh, what happened at this point, though, is I decided I would go home. I would go back to this place right here. Uh, this is a hay field which, where I grew up in central Colorado. I grew up on a small cattle ranch, and uh, this is a gravity-fed sprinkler system. And I wanted to do a, a larger story, closer to my heart, closer to my home. And I wanted to understand this issue I keep hearing about water, scarcity, contamination. So I decided to follow the water that we use to feed our cattle ranch, which originates here in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, 14,000 foot peaks. And I followed it all 1,500 miles, seven states, two countries, with a focus on what's changing, what is happening. Where, why are these white lines appearing on Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam near Las Vegas, which represent the water we used to have? And I wanted to understand how the tributaries that feed this river, like the Gila in Arizona, become this from 1930 to today. And when you follow the Colorado River to its end, or now its new end, in the delta of Mexico, you see what happens when we ask too much of a limited resource. It simply disappears. The Colorado River flowed to the sea for six million years, and not a drop of it has reached the ocean for two decades. It was one of the largest desert estuaries in North America, and now it is basically just a cracked, parched earth. At this point, this was three years in this journey, I did a, a bunch of films and a, a book, and I was invited back upstream to this place. The Grand Canyon, where I was invited to tell a story of the architect of the canyon, the river inside it, and what is becoming of it, and how it's changing downstream. And when I started the project of the river, I figured the Grand Canyon is the most protected piece of landscape on this river. This was the shiny pearl on the necklace. It didn't need the attention of my lenses. But when I came to do a talk, I was surprised to hear that there was a host of threats across this landscape. And so here's where I got the unusual idea to lace up my shoes and do a different type of adventure as a backbone to tell the story of this place. I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure I really like hiking that much. With a heavy pack and no guarantee of water, it's hard, stressful, and very slow. Sure. Hiking can lead to some zen-like moments, but not so much if you're lost, really tired, and dehydrated. Yet there's something about the Grand Canyon and its rocky, secret world. It is alluring, magical even. So in the fall of 2015, my friend and author, Kevin Fedarko and I, set out to walk the entirety of the Grand Canyon from east to west. 
In order to understand the insanity of this venture, you first have to know a little bit about this place. In stretches, it is 18 miles wide and over a mile deep. So deep, in fact, you could stack five Empire State Buildings, one on top on the other, inside. It is 277 miles long if you're floating the Colorado River. But on foot, by the time you've gone up and back down the numerous side canyons, it's more like 700 miles. <laughs> oh yeah, and for most of it, there's no trail. As a result, more people have stood on the surface of the moon than have completed a continuous through hike of the Grand Canyon. It may have been the brushiest, scratchiest, longest day. Oh. I'll get him. I fell into a barrel cactus. And now I got all these weird lumps on my arm. This is wild. Wondering what the hell we've gotten ourselves into. I was told that uh, yesterday would be the hardest day. I, I don't see any difference whatsoever between yesterday, the day before yesterday, the first day, and today. My body's falling apart. Kevin and I would be the first journalists ever to tackle this hiking lunacy. We plan to complete our mission over a year, watching the seasons change, and teaming up with Hardin Canyon veterans oh, to help work. us find our way and our legs. We're running low on food. And uh, if we don't keep walking, we're not going to get to our food cache in time. So my big question is, when do I start to panic? Right now. Beyond that challenge, something else drew us on this quest. The Grand Canyon is facing an unprecedented array of pressures from all four points on the compass. Development projects are poised to change the integrity of perhaps the most monumental landscape in America. This is the most protected place in the world. And yet, what do you think I spend most of my time doing? is protecting this place. We believe walking the park might give us a unique perspective on this secret world and what's at stake to be lost. When I started this project, I had, let's call it, the false illusion that it would be something like this. It would be walking beautiful sand beaches through emerald light uh, with lots of time to reflect on the beauty and majesty of the place. This little stretch of beach was the only stretch of beach I ever set foot on uh, because if you move laterally through this landscape, you have to move vertically. You have to move up through the layers of rock and time and when you move vertically, you have to go back down, often to find water or food, which our friends help or left in food caches. When you combine this with a temperature that swings up to 108 degrees at night, you quickly start to realize, just a few days into this project, that I'd stepped into something a little harsher than I had ever anticipated. And if you don't see the anguish on my face, well, you, here's a little closer glimpse of it written on our feet. The soles of our shoes delaminated, so did our feet. And then there's the issue of how do you carry enough food? You can't if you want to keep moving. So you quickly, your body changes and you change to the place. But it wasn't about the hardship of us finding a way through it. It was about this landscape. And it was about trying to understand how this could change. This is the Navajo Nation land which borders the Grand Canyon National Park. This is where the Grand Escalade is proposed to be built where 10,000 people would come down into the canyon a day. Which if you talk to many of the people that live here, like this woman, Renee Yellowhorse for the Navajo Nation, this is her Sistine Chapel. The confluence of these two rivers inside the heart of the canyon is where they all come to pray and is where they believe they came from. So remarkably, the people that live near the canyon are pushing back as 
hard and as effectively as possible with very little. Her and her friends, basically 12 Navajo women, of which only four of them speak English, fought back this billion dollar development and remarkably have put it on hold for now, on pause. Uh, they are playing the long game on this development and it's an example of how we're looking at this park as a way to turn its beauty into cash. If you look downstream as we moved, you see where six and a half million visitors come to the Grand Canyon now. This is the South Rim. And because there's so many people coming, there is this allure to develop. On the back side of this photo is proposed to put in a water ski park, three million square feet of commercial space. And that may be good in some ways, but there's a giant question in this arid landscape of where water comes from. The water inside the canyon is always affected by what happens on the rim. And this water sustains a remarkable, rich, vast biodiversity and oases inside it. It also sustained us. This creek in particular was interesting because when we came to it, it was too contaminated to drink. It was actually radioactive because there's evidence and a history of uranium mining all around the canyon on the north and south rim. Now, uranium mining may be the future and some argue for clean energy, but in this landscape, it is complicated. And many people have been doing tests to try to understand the maze of water that runs through this place. They actually put in blue dye not far from this mine, which is on the north rim, trying to figure out where that dye would emerge. To their amazement, instead of appearing downstream in the Colorado River, it appeared 26 miles upstream at an elevation gain of 3,000 feet. So it reveals that the complexity of the water table here, the water table that supports 40 million people in the southwest on the Colorado River, is complex. The uranium industry says this is the richest cores of uranium in the United States, and they're doing everything legally. However, many people around it are concerned, particularly these people, the Havasupai who have lived there for centuries, say they're living on the front lines of a water contamination issue, as well as everyone else that pulls water from the Colorado River downstream. As fall turned into winter, the storms moved in, the hot temperature swing quickly got cold, and this furnace of a landscape quickly turned to a frozen realm, which becomes very complicated. Friends joined me to walk through to help carry food and with snow, it became very complex, one misstep, and you could easily go 3,000 feet. At the same time, I would say that this snow brought this new layered cake beauty to the place that I reveled in and, and loved. And it just showed the diversity and change of this landscape as it moves through the seasons. As winter melted into the spring, we walked through a doorway into what's called the Godscape, Western Grand Canyon, where the puzzles of rock and water get more complicated, more hard to find. But it is also more silent and beautiful. We also came to the final development area on the Grand Canyon in the far west pocket, a place called Helicopter Alley, which many tourists now come and enjoy and they get to see the Grand Canyon. They get to check their bucket list. But this did not exist two decades ago and it has now become the busiest helicopter landing spot in the world. I walked through here to try to understand it and I did a photographic Merge. I spent a day documenting what one day of traffic looks like in this landscape and how it's affecting it. To my amazement, it was more than I anticipated. This is 363 flights that I merged together over an eight hour period and this was an idle average Tuesday in July. The helicopters now fly year round up to 400 flights a day and it represents that tug of war between access and conservation and how do we find a balance? And as you walk through the final stretches of the canyon, many say, don't go there, it's, there's too noisy. But to my amazement, the slot canyons were more beautiful and deeper. The ramparts that we walked up, climbing up ancient 900,000 year old ancient Puebloan roots were even larger. And every bit of it in the far west from sunrise to sunset echoed with the sounds of turbine engines. You could hear the helicopter sound from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day we moved through this landscape. And finally, on a Wednesday in November, my friend Kevin and I stepped across the northwest corner of Grand Canyon National Park, a border so remote that it is delineated and marked only by three metal stakes jammed in the ground. 
This represented roughly 750 miles of hiking for us, sp spread over eight trips over the course of 13 months, eight pairs of shoes, four sprained ankles, two broken fingers, two girlfriends, the list goes on and on. <laughs> However, the project was about looking at this place. What are the numbers of this landscape that we lived inside and had this immersion in? It has actually some of the greatest biodiversity of all the national parks in the United States. The range of biodiversity stretches from the equivalent of the Mexican border to the Canadian border. 1,700 species, 91 mammals, 40 amphibians. It is truly remarkable. The late author Edward Abbey once wrote, you have to crawl on hands and knees through the sagebrush and the sandstone and the cactus and when traces of blood start to mark your trail, then you will see something, maybe. So what did we see? This was an immersion to shine a light on this place and try to understand and learn how lucky we are to have this. And after doing it, for reflecting on it, I come away with three lessons, three gifts as I'd say. The first is that we often think of the Grand Canyon, whether you've been there or not, as a place we defined visually. We think of it through color or we think of it through texture. But having spent that much time inside the place, I'm haunted by this concept to some degree because the one defining element that I cannot forget is that I define this place now with auditory. It's the silence. The blanket of deep silence that hangs over this landscape is like something I've never experienced. And it's not a silence void of noise, it's just a silence rich with natural sounds and not mechanical sounds. It's the, the flutter of bat wings in the morning or the distant bleat of sheep across the canyon wall. Those little things that you've forgotten to hear it was so quiet at times, too, that my microphones and my cameras and my video cameras actually didn't work because they're calibrated to a noisier silence. And you quickly realize when you spend time in that deep, deep, dense silence how fragile it is and how quickly it can be broken with the machines we bring into the place. The second lesson is happened every day about this time. As we would finish our day, no matter how hard it was, no matter how tired we were, that emerald light would fade and you would hear below you the distant roar of the great American Nile, the Colorado River that sculpted this landscape humming below you. And then as the light would descend into nightfall and you get ready to go to sleep under the stars, you would realize that there's really two rivers. There's the river that carved and sculpted this place below you and there's a second river the river of stars that sweeps over you every single night. It became so bright and so luminous that I could not stop focusing on it. I would get up and photograph every single night. And you realize how bright the stars are because if you use the help of NASA and you step up, you see the sweep of light pollution that's moving across the United States, frankly, the entire planet. If you look on the left side, you can see the only canyon visible from outer space, the Grand Canyon. And when you're inside that landscape, you realize how magical this night sky is. The third lesson or gift is that when we look out in this place, we often think of it as empty, vast. But you quickly realize how full of life it is with the biodiversity, but you also realize how full it is of archaeology. Wherever we went, there are tools of the people that came before us, the ancient Puebloans that called this place home. And in certain areas, you can see where they stored their food on the right side of this image. It's called granaries, where they would conceal food for a year, 
And in secret spots, you would find where they left their mark. Some of it 4,000 years old. Some argue that this could be as old as 10,000 years. And we often ask, well, where did these people go? What happened to them? But you quickly realize they haven't gone anywhere. They're still with us today, and they surround Grand Canyon National Park. There are 11 Native American tribes that still call this home and live up in the Rim area. And they are, frankly, on all sides of the development issues and challenges, on the precipice of how to move forward, how to find economic stability in this place, and how to preserve it. Which leaves us to ask the question of how do we see this landscape? Whether you're an American or you've, you're not, this really is, it's not a national park, it is a world park. It is the seventh natural wonder of the world. So do we see it as a bucket list, to check off for amusement, or do we see this place as sacred, sacrosanct, that is really a living classroom of not just geology, but biodiversity, archaeology, that's soaked in silence and shrouded in starlight, that offers perhaps the greatest lesson of all, and that is of humility. And as we, as Americans, pass this forward to the next generation, we all have to keep that in mind. Because I can tell you, we already have over 400 amusement parks that dot the American landscape. And we only have one place that looks like this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was, that was humbling. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Andrea. So uh, I put the question to Andrea, pretend I'm a child, and how do you describe your job? And she said, I am a teacher. It's pretty simple. Andrea, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. So, yes, I am a teacher, and I'm currently a teacher in a school in the UK in Brent, London. And that's me with my kids, and do not adjust your sets, but I am a teacher of the arts. However, in March just gone, last year, um, I was blessed, I was fortunate enough to be nominated for this award called the Varki Foundation Global Teacher Prize. And I was amongst um, the ten finalists there. And um, I won. And I won out of 30,000 applications um, from about 150 different countries. And I won. And I'm still pinching myself to find out why was that the case. Um, and I'm still on a fantastic road of discovery. But I think and I'm hoping that it's because the role of the teacher for me never, ever ends when the lesson is over. The role of the teacher is something that continues and continues. So let me tell you a little bit about my day, my, my life and what, I, what happens to me. So these are my students and this is my art room. Um, I teach secondary education in the UK, so that's um, ages from 11 to 18. And I love my job. How many people can say that? I love my job. Because I get the pleasure and the privilege of inspiring young minds. I teach them art and I teach them textiles. And these are subjects which they actually rush to go to in my school. Why? Because it's where they get the opportunity to be themselves. The opportunity to be able to break from the norm, the, the opportunity to make mistakes, the opportunity to be resilient, the opportunity to be okay with a word. That didn't work out, but that's okay. Let me try again. Being resilient. And uh, my children do experience a lot of resilience in their daily lives. So as you can see, my particular school we have um, is a very multicultural school. We have approximately um, 90 languages spoken in our school. And it's in the inner city of London. And with inner city schools, there is lots of um, social problems, as you can imagine. So many of my students are carers, many of my students um, don't ha come from a single parent family. Many of my students lived in multiple occupancy houses, which maybe are not that legal. <laughs> um, and they struggle and they are exposed to gangs outside their, their, their streets, outside their homes. 
um, they are approached, yet they get themselves to school. And that's why it is a privilege to teach them because our children have got so much resilience. They know they want to do the right thing and they know that being in school is a safe place for them. And that's why we must make sure that we protect our students and protect our schools. It's got to be their beacon and it's got to be the place where we make sure that everything is possible for them. And I try and create that in my art room. There comes times in, in every teacher's lives whereby you have those moments, and I call them the wow moments, the moments where um, something happens, a child does a piece of work, and that just blows you away. And that happens because you know their journey. Now, on the screen there in front of me, you've got a, um, two pieces of artwork from two different students there. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask a question to the audience in the room. From those students, which one of those do you think has special educational needs? So do you think it's the student whose work is on that side of the room or the student on this side? So if I was to ask you, like a teacher would do, put your hands up. So if you'd like to put your hands up, if you think the student is on that side of the room, the student who's, um, uh, who has special educational needs, please do raise your hands. Excellent. Thank you very much. How about on the other side? Oh, wow, fantastic. Great, and that was a majority of you for this student. Well, actually, they both have. And this is the one crucial message that I'd like to tell you about the arts. The arts are the most inclusive subjects. They don't discriminate. They do not care if you can speak. They do not care if you can write. They do not care if you are able to be fluent in maths, in algebra. That's, that's not the problem. But what it helps them to do is to communicate. And from the artwork, I have learned so much about the human being and what is possible and what they can achieve. So for this particular student here, um, and, I'm, and I'll take you through his work here. So this is one of my boys here. Um, he came to the school when he was 14 years old. So he had two more years left um, from secondary education. He came from a special needs school and this student here was mute. He did not speak and he was um, not able to communicate and he was, he was almost like a ghost. We, when he came to the school, we offered him a very bespoke program and art was a subject which he said, yeah, I'd like to do. Um, he, on the first lesson, he, he was invited into the art room and he produced a piece of work but, um, and um, then he quickly packed away and he left. On the second lesson, he came back into the room again. But I, and as I was walking around the lesson, seeing what they were doing, I could see underneath his table, underneath where he had his bag, there was a piece of work hanging out. And it obviously it was his own work. And I knew he put that on purpose. It was there for me to be able to, to see it. So I quickly went out to him and I said, you know, may I? Can I have a look at this? And as I pulled it out, it was the most amazing drawing I've ever seen. It was a drawing of um, a guitar, a bass guitar. So it's quite clear that this student had a passion for music. Um, and the tone was beautiful. The tone was accurate. And at that moment, my face was like, oh, my God, who drew this? And then he's like, and the first time I heard this child speak, he was like, miss, it's it, me, I did it. And I was like, tell me. And he goes, you know, I don't know, tell me, I, I want to know. Very slowly, we built up his vocabulary. I was interested, and this guy had talent. He had extraordinary talent. And the work that we've got on the screen here is um, a work of his final piece for his GCSE exam. Now, he undertook his GCSE exam, and he got one GCSE, and that was from his art subject. And when he came out from that exam hall, and when he, was, when he opened up his envelope to see his results, um, I mean, his face was just blown away because it meant that with his grade, he could then study A-level art. And he's currently doing his A-level art now, and I've got absolutely no, no hesitation that he will be a success, that he will not only get into a university and do gaming design, which is what he wants to do, but the possibility that he has now got the confidence. He can decide what the future is going to be. And that's through the power of being in an art room and being allowed to have the opportunity and the time to succeed. 
within our lessons also, as you can imagine now, we have loads of students and our, our world are, is exposed to social media and our children don't know how to cope with this. They're very vulnerable. And this piece of artwork here is from a girl who um, was really affected by who do I have to be? Who, what's my identity? Do I have to look like this? Do I have to look like that? Who do I need to connect with? And as you can see, that piece of work there is almost like um, her communication to us to say, help me, I am not right. Lo and behold, we discovered she was undertaking, or she was unfortunately experiencing self-harm. So again, it's, a, it's, it's the way that we are abling or communicating to our students. Are we listening to what they're saying? And this piece of work blew me away. So this piece of work um, is a very recent piece of work, and it's from a student who was taking her GCSE exam. Um, and a very quiet girl, she's a refugee who, t who came to our school uh, two years ago. And uh, she loves art, um, you know, very, you know, happy to be part of the art environment. And this was a piece of work that she did, and the project was called Again Identity. And you can see so much from that piece of work. I mean, you can see the dove in the top corner there. And you can see there's a bubble, a speech mark there that was left blank. Now this girl, her journey to, to from, um, from her country to the UK uh, was horrendous, horrific. And you know, it still gives me goosebumps to find out exactly what it was that she had to undertake. And you wouldn't want anyone, let alone you know, any child, to undertake that. But you know, thankfully, she's, she's here with us now. And I was waiting, I remember waiting, um, just watching while she was doing her work. And I was thinking, right, OK, uh, she's got three hours left. That's fine. Most of it's done. But she still hasn't done that bubble there. OK, let me come back. So um, you know, I'd come back, and I'll be going. So she still hasn't. She's, nope, she's not done it. And then right at the end, the time up was for the exam. And I was like, oh what's going on? She goes, Miss, what's wrong? I was like, what were you going to say? What were you going to say in that bubble mark, that, bu that speech mark? Right, audience, what do you think this child wanted to say? Yes. She wanted to express that she had the right to say. Excellent, thank you. Peace at home, peace at world. Anything else? When I asked her, what do you want to say in there? She turned around and she says, but miss, who will listen to me? Who will listen to my voice? That's our job now, especially where we are in, um, in this week. We can really help these children. So um, with my award that I received in March, I, I was given a um, million dollars. <laughs> I know, wow, yeah? Uh, <laughs> I was given a million dollars, as you do. You know, you give a teacher a million dollars. Um, extraordinary. The Varkey Foundation, there's a Sonny Varkey. He um, decided that, you know, the, to raise a profile of teachers. And I am, if you know me, you will know that I will almost burn your ears off talking about creativity and the arts in education, how important they are. So I decided to put my money where my mouth was and uh, to set up a foundation, a charity called Artists in Residence, because I have got this huge belief that children need to see role models. They can't see where the future lies because they can't have, they don't see what the jobs and opportunities are. So with Artists in Residence, I've decided to invite artists to give back by coming into schools and having the opportunity to talk about their art to children, to inspire children, to have a chance to almost promote what they're saying with a hope, with a fingers crossed hope that maybe they would like to undertake a career in the professions of arts. Because I do feel that now, I mean, we know with, with the WEF report that says uh, back to, um, the, futures, uh, the future jobs, that creativity is one of the top traits that students need. And if we don't make sure that the arts are in our schools, what chance will our students have? So I'm just going to quickly fly through these ones. So what's happening is that we've got some really prestigious artists who are now going into schools and they are changing minds. They're inspiring our children. And our children are saying, hang on, you mean you, mean you do a job? That's your job? 
and wow, that's amazing. Um, and, and this is brilliant. This is the kind of conversations that we need to be having. Our children need to see their potential, that where, they, where they need to be aiming for. And by having professionals coming to the schools, not just artists, but any professionals, um, you can and will be inspiring them. So please, please, if you have an opportunity to go into the schools, please do that. And it's fantastic, you know, it's, it's really, it's making a huge difference. And not only that, the artists are feeling, yes, this is just, just what I needed to be back and to inspire. And we also, it's not just artists I have, it's also um, thespians as well. So we have uh, um, the wonderful Michael Attenborough, who is one of the artists who's going in to teach Shakespeare into um, schools in very deprived communities. And the kids are loving it, they're absolutely thriving. So I hope I've convinced you about the powers of the arts, but now there's something else that I'm really um, keen to really stamp my foot and shake and say, look, what's going on, world? Um, and that's what are we doing about our teachers? What's happening to our teachers? I saw this magazine, um, the Times magazine, which published this extraordinary article. Um, and this, ha this is happening everywhere in the world whereby teachers who have got MAs, who are extremely um, qualified and professional, are having to earn and, and, or having to work two jobs in order for them to make ends meet. And this particular colleague is having to donate blood just because to, to pay her rent. And so I went to the States and I, met, I went into um, a school in New York and I asked the teacher, I go, look, you know, I saw this report, I saw this magazine, here it is. And I go, is this for real? Does this happen? Do you have two jobs? And she goes to me, Andrea, come with me. So we went into the staff room. She opened up her locker and she goes, what's that? And I go, I don't know. So I took it out and it was a uniform. And she goes, I, when I finish teaching here at five o'clock, I go to this hotel and I'm a valet. And these are professionals who are responsible for educating our children. And this is not the only country. This is happening in many countries. So if we are not looking after our teachers, what kind of a future are our children going to have? And I think we're forgetting that, actually, if you want to see the world, please visit a school. If you want to see what your country is going to be like, go into a classroom. There it is in front of you. And these are the people who we need to make sure we are protecting, teachers and our young minds. And to finish off, I'm going to leave you with this piece of work. Now, you know I tell you that I have wow moments. Um, I have 80% I'm ripping my hair out moments when I'm in school. But I have 20% wow moments. And this is one of my wow moments. So um, two years ago, we had this wonderful student who joined us. Um, she came from India. And uh, she arrived. Now, the, 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 the region she was in India, um, she'd never attended school. And she was 11 years old. So the first time she came to our school, she had just started um, in the secondary education. So she came in. She was very shy, very timid. Obviously not fluent, had no English um, language whatsoever. She came into the school, and, but she used to seem to enjoy art lessons. She came into the art room. Um, and um, what I did was I set the class a piece of homework and I said, please, can you um, draw a figure that would inspire you? You know, Beyonce or, you know, um, Lewis Hamilton. Who is your inspirational figure? Because we're just doing a project on portraiture, portraiture just then. And um, after the end of this classroom, I asked the student to come near to me, and I just said, look, I'd like you to, um, as, you know, as broken English as I could, I'd like you to translate, or I'd like you to try and draw a picture of your mum, your dad, or you. And I gave her some piece of paper, which I have literally just pulled out of a sketchbook, because I couldn't ha didn't have anything to hand. And I gave her a packet of oil pastels, and those oil pastels about, cost about um, two euros. Um, two days later, she came back to my class before her lesson and she handed me this piece of work. And I was mesmerized. She's 12. She's 12. She can't speak English. She can't access any of the curriculum at the moment. But my God, look at this talent. My God, look what she's trying to translate to us. 
And when you're having a look at this piece of art, well, what do you, the first thing I say to myself is, why, what is going on in her head? Look at those eyes, aren't they haunting? What has this child seen? What is the message? And I'm happy to say that because of this celebration of this work, which I've obviously gone and told the whole world in my school community, look what she's done. Um, she now walks around the school with pride. Actually, she skips, she's a skipper. She skips down the corridors. As you can imagine, the 12 year old do. Um, she comes in, she goes, hello, miss. Thank you, miss. Goodbye, miss. Three, language, three words. She helps to set up the classroom. But the most important thing is that she feels that she's part of the community and she can and she will. And she, my friends, definitely will. She will succeed. And she will go wherever she wants to go. Because for her, the power of the arts has helped to unlock her potential. It's helped us to communicate who she is. And I just want to leave that as my final image and my last message to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. OK, so uh, that was very inspiring, fighting back the tears. Um, now for our last uh, panelist. Um, this lady, Caroline, I said to her, um, I'm a simple man. Tell me in simple words, what do you do for a job? And she said, I dream with my eyes open. Uh, with that said, uh, Caroline, would you like to come up here and sit here and uh, talk about your heart and your mind? Thank you. Um, I'm not going to sit. I, I'm not somebody who Great. does what they're told. <laughs> Good. But it's strange to have you with my backs to you. Thank you both. Um, the wings of transformation are born through patience and struggle. I want to tell you a story that I heard on Sunday that captures what I want to talk about today. There was a man who was documenting how a caterpillar goes from the cocoon to a butterfly. And during the day, he was fascinated at the process of when the caterpillar emerges from the chrysalis. And there was one particular caterpillar that he was fascinated by and he thought it was struggling. So he got his tiny knife and slitted the cocoon to help the butterfly. So the butterfly emerges, but it very quickly collapses and it dies. And the realization about this is that actually because this little caterpillar hadn't pushed against the cocoon, it had not built up the strength to survive, to have the life force. Because he had made it easy. She hadn't found her wings. And so I think it's a great message is that we need to be gentle with our struggles. And when we talk about resilience, and what a powerful force and part of our lives they are. So for all of those of us right now who are going through the pushing against the cocoon, whether because we've lost somebody, because our heart is broken, because we are struggling with illness, because we just simply do not think we're good enough, because the no's are coming more than the yeses, my invitation to you is keep trucking. It's an Irish expression or my family expression, which is simply keep going. Because it's for those struggles that I stand here on this stage in this most important week of my life. For 20 years, my soul has had a purpose that has burnt through every single disappointment and success with disappointment to lead me to this place. And there is no way I would have had the courage the strength and that absolute fire in the belly to see this through, if it were not for that. My gorgeous father, Jerry Casey, unexpectedly had passed away two years ago. And he was the man who had basically told me, be yourself. 
be yourself. It was through his death, because he had told me that again, days before he died, that I found the courage to fulfill this wide open dream that I've held for so many years, to launch a global campaign for disability business inclusion. Over the years of a career that has spanned 17 years, I was like, well, who am I to do that? I'm 47 years old, why would I? Somebody else, somebody younger, somebody better. What will they think about me? But in his death, I realized the only way that I was going to fail is if I didn't begin. And I didn't want to die regretting that I didn't try. So in that grief, I found a way. I don't know why, and I don't know how to this day. And in 2017, in August of 2017, I launched that campaign, hashtag valuable. And why did I do it? Well, because we've talked about for years the inconvenient truth that Al Gore talked about here. When I was here as my first Davos years and years ago, well, let me just tell you the uncomfortable truth. The uncomfortable truth is that inclusion is not for everyone. There is a disability inequality crisis out in the world where you're 50% more likely to experience poverty, you're 50% less likely to get a job. Collectively, this group of people is the most marginalized and discriminated group in the world. Yet there are 1.3 billion people in the world who currently today experience disability. That's more than vegans, I'm telling you. Seriously, 80% of that 1.3 billion acquire it in their working lifetime, between the ages of 18 and 64. 80% of it is invisible, okay? But the, the, the crazy thing is, if every one of us had a mom and a dad who loved us, it affects 53% of our global population. And every human on this planet is going to touch disability at some point in their life. And why is it still on the sidelines? Well, my passionate belief is the only way that we can eradicate this inequality crisis is to work with the most powerful force on this planet. It has been my belief for nearly two decades. If, in, if business was to see the value of people with disabilities and their families, then society would too. Inclusive business would create inclusive societies. Charity is not going to fix this alone. Governments cannot. Business can. And yet, a further uncomfortable truth. It remains on the sidelines of business. Why? Why, when this is 20% of our global market, one in seven of us, why? Because we still haven't understood the extraordinary value, which is worth eight trillion, and the talent that exists, and everything out there that is waiting to release the social, economic, and business potential of 1.3 billion people. The other uncomfortable truth is, actually, the inclusion agenda in the world of business is diverse -ish. <laughs> Weird, but we are competing in the inclusion agendas. You know, disability against LGBTQ, against gender, against race. It's crazy. We don't need pick and mix, mix inclusion. We don't have to have a la carte inclusion. It is the human experience. And this has been the driving force of my heart to say, if we could see business represent society in their corporate cultures, then we could eradicate exclusion, couldn't we? Because the question is why? And the most powerful force in business is business leaders. Look what happened when Sheryl Sandberg lent in, a leader of influence, brand of Facebook and platforms. So through Valuable, we wanted to find the most important leaders and brands and platforms to position disability equally on the global business leadership agenda. And that's important. It's important statistically, it's important for all of us because if we all belong, the world is better, right? It's not one or the other. But it is also so personal to me. Why? Well, I was born in 1971 and I was born with a very rare condition called ocular albinism. I am and was born at the level of being registered legally blind. And for those of you who don't have a clue what that means, because I certainly didn't, 
It means after my hands, it's blur. It, I'm very well known for saying it. You all get to look like George Clooney, particularly this man down here. You get to be the best looking of all. But the extra extraordinary thing for me is, I often think if we took everybody's glasses who wore glasses off, we'd have how many billions of people disabled in the world? So my parents, when I was born, and they knew about this condition, made one of the most bonkers decisions in the world. They chose not to tell me. They chose to bring me up as a sighted child. They believed that if they gave me a label, it would limit me because we're so many of our labels. They didn't want my wings clipped with a definition of what is normal and able. And so I went through all of my school life thinking I could see just like any of the rest of you until I was 17 years old. And I went to get my motorbike license. I'm obsessed with motorbikes and cars. And my father was the one to give me a driving lesson. How crazy is that? I had other dreams at the time. I wanted to be Mowgli from the Jungle Book. And I also wanted to be a cowgirl. If I had been brave enough, maybe or not, I would have had a whole slideshow for you. But I need to be myself. I couldn't see that slideshow. And I need to belong as who I am and not fit in. I hope that my words will paint the pictures that these two so eloquently had. Because I see differently to you. But at 17 years old, I would not have been able to admit that. I decided to do my first conscious act, and I hope only one of discrimination. I rejected that I had a disability. I discriminated against my tribe of 1.3 billion, and I hid it for fear that I would not have the dreams that I, I wanted to have come true. And I went through 11 years of my life. I, went to, I was an archeologist, by the way, crazy for somebody visually impaired and in the closet, and then went to business school and then ended up in a management consultancy firm, Accenture, which is extraordinary that they didn't pick up I couldn't see. And it was only when I was with them two and a half years, I eventually found the courage to come out of the closet and own who I am fully because I was so desperately tired trying to be perfect. And in doing that moment, I fulfilled that first dream to become Mowgli from the Jungle Book. And from management consultant to Mowgli from the Jungle Book, I did it by going across India on the back of an elephant. And it triggered these two decades of reframing disability, not just for society, to myself, but also to business. For the last nearly two decades, I have fought to do what I wanted, to get business to see that value and worth. We have had extraordinary success and extraordinary failures. It has been up and down, every shape that you go on, but this burning desire to create a world where everyone belongs has just pushed me forward more than anything I've ever known. Through marriage breakups, businesses closing, awards and everything else, I stand here firm because this is not a conversation about disability. It is about humanity. Every single one of us has the right to belong and no human being should ever be defined by one tiny part of them because we all have difference. So when I launched Hashtag Valuable in August 2017, I thought it was big to make the decision. I didn't think for one moment that anybody would say no to my crazy idea. No, 53 companies in the world said no. And I didn't know what to do. And so I decided to fulfill the second ambition, which was to be a cowgirl. I rode across Colombia to the stage of One Young World on a horse, I'm not a horsewoman, a thousand kilometers in five weeks. And we got the voice of 810 million people to say I wasn't crazy. On the stage of One Young World in October 2019, the very first global business leader stood on the stage. And his name was Paul Pohman of Unilever. I had wanted to meet him for years. Now I had to ride a horse for it, but we got him. And after, he called me and he said, how are you going to make this ambition come true? He said, go out and find the leaders, go out and find the brands and go and get the platform. And I said, I have no money, I'm exhausted. We had remortgaged our house. My grief was still pulsing through my veins. And he said, you must finish 
what you have begun. So I stand here this week. We did get the leaders, Paul Pullman of Unilever, Mark Weinberg of EY, Janet Riccio of Omnicom, and Richard Branson. We did get the brands, Omnicom, the biggest media group in the world, and Virgin Media to back us. 24 hours before my board shut me down, I had a, a promise of financial support just to keep going. And then Paul Pullman and the World Economic Forum opened up the conversation about disability inclusion. And they've done it before, WEF, but this time they gave it socks. It is everywhere, because if disability is included, we all get to benefit. This is a transformative moment for change and for inclusion. On Thursday, we will have a press conference at 3.45 to announce the valuable 500. In 365 days, we ask 500 CEOs to put disability on their board agenda and make one commitment. It will be the tipping point for change. And that will be followed at 5.30 on the main stage in the World Economic Forum. Five of the biggest companies and their leaders for the very first time in history will talk about disability. I have never been so scared and excited. I am now ready to retire. This is what my heart wanted. It's time for me now to step back and let the tribe go forward. And these are the resilience lessons that I have learned. I have learned in looking at Pete's beautiful, beautiful pictures, though I could hardly see them. I had tears rolling down my eyes. It reminds me that cliches do work. The darkest hour is genuinely before dawn. I have never, I've nearly given up more than you could even imagine. And here we are right now. I have learned that change, you can't give it a deadline. There's no such thing as it. And you know what? As I stand back and I look at it, it all makes sense to hear. So for those of you who are struggling with it, let it go. Let the deadline go. I have learned more than anything that nothing defines you, no success, no falling in love, no great moment, no stage opportunity, no award, no death will ever define who you are. You get to get up every day and start again. I have learned that your vision, the vision of what you want will keep you alive. And yet you don't need eyes to see to have a vision. But that vision will get you through the darkest bits. I have learned that dreams are the power that have kept me going and keeping my eyes open to see where they happen. And I have learned that magic does exist. It's just you have got to choose to believe it. Because if I could share the serendipity moments that have broken open my heart a thousand times, my life is like, like fairy lights you put on a Christmas tree. That, uh, that every single light is a moment of magic which was preceded by pain. But that's where the growth came. Leonard Cohen says, it's the light where the cracks get in. Oh my God, it is. And the string that keeps those fairy lights together is resilience. It is our life force. So I started with this quote. Very simply, the wings of transformation 